So how amazed are you that I could stand here waiting to talk to you and still play the piano? Thank you for laughing. That was the desired result. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together, isn't it? Amen. <clears throat> Steve and Martha uh, can't be with us today, and so you're stuck with the rest of us. I hope that's okay. I do want to point out some things in the bulletin. <clears throat> if you're going to order Easter flowers in memory or in honor of someone, that needs to be the ch to the church office by tomorrow morning. If you want to put that in the offering plate, you can. Also, we are at Palm Sunday, and that is the beginning of Holy Week, and it's an exciting time in the life of the church um, exciting and somber and celebratory and all of the things. This Thursday, we have a service for Monday Thursday at 7 p.m., <clears throat> and it will be a very simple service of prayer and communion and scripture and music. And then on Friday, we invite you to come to our Tenebrae service also at 7, and the choir will be offering a few pieces as well as some congregational music. <clears throat> the Micah meal is coming up the week after Easter, so please make plans to join us for that as well. And you'll notice in the bulletin that the um, United Women in Faith, did I say that right, will be having their basement sale coming up May 2nd. Can you believe that we're already in April of 2023? It's crazy. So those are the announcements. Um, we are so excited to hear those voices of the children in the room today, and they are going to be helping us with our parade of palms during the first hymn today. So when Tori begins the call to worship, I'll invite the kids to come back and join me in the back. Now, let go of what the world has given you this week, and remember our Savior as he rode into Jerusalem today, remembering his entrance as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let the worship begin.
as I start with our call to worship. Blessed are you, O Lord, God of our ancestors, and to be praised and highly exalted forever. And blessed is your glorious holy name, and to be highly praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you in the temple of your holy glory, and to be extolled and highly glorified forever. Blessed are you who look into the depths from your throne on the cherubim, and to be praised and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you on the throne of your kingdom, and to be extolled and highly exalted forever. Blessed are you in the firmament of heaven, and to be sung and glorified forever. Please stand and join me in singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna, as our kids come around and do our palm parade. <laughs> cute, aren't they? <laughs> Please join me in responding to our opening prayer. Lord of abundant pardon and mercy, be with us in this day as we parade through Jerusalem gates, wanting the reign of God to be established immediately in the hearts of all people. Make us aware that fear and anger are powerful motivators for evil. Open our hearts to the words of Jesus that we might find courage and healing for all of our burdens. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on me in my anguish. My eyes are red from weeping. My health is broken from sorrow. I am pining away in grief. My years are shortened, drained away because of sadness. My sins have sapped my strength. I stoop with sorrow and with shame. I am scorned by all my enemies and even more by the neighbors and friends. They dread meeting me and look the other way when I go by. I am forgotten like a dead man like a broken and discarded pot. I heard the lies about me, the slanders of my enemies. Everywhere I looked, I was afraid, for they were plotting against my life. But I am trusting you, O Lord. I said, you alone are my God. My times are in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine upon your servant. Save me just because you are so kind.
Please respond for the affirmation from Philippians 2, 5, verses, verses 5 through 11. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though we have been born of God, we do not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming a human being. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him the name of all names, so that in Jesus every heaven. Join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me as we respond to Rejoice, O Zion's Daughter, to the tune of All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
Good morning. My little friends probably remember me from Sunday school. You guys remember me from Sunday school? It's good to see you this morning. My name is Elizabeth, for those of you that don't remember. I really enjoyed seeing you guys in your palm parade today. Was that fun? Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of a celebration we have here in Buchanan, West Virginia. Can you think of what it might be? I'll give you a clue. I brought my sign holder today to help me out. Can you guys see this? The Strawberry Festival. What's something special we do at the Strawberry Festival every year? We have a parade, that's right. And when we have a parade, what are we doing? Eating, having fun with our friends, meeting new people, coming out as a community and joining together. And we're celebrating and welcoming each other and others, right? Well, thousands of years ago, Jesus was going to Jerusalem with his 12 disciples. And the people of Jerusalem were so excited that they lined the streets and they brought their palm branches and they cheered and they shouted and they waved their palm branches and they said, does anybody know what they said? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. They were so excited to see Jesus. And that's what we do when we have a parade here in Buckhannon for the Strawberry Festival, right? We come out and we welcome each other, and we're so excited to see our neighbors and friends and celebrate life in here in our community. And on Palm Sunday, that's why we have a Palm Parade at our church, right? Because we're remembering, welcoming Jesus, not just on this Sunday as we go into Holy Week or Easter Week, but we're remembering welcoming Jesus into our lives every day, right? So that's our special thing I would like to ask you to remember to do this week and every day. I would like you to remember to welcome Jesus every day with joy and excitement. Can you do that for me this week and try to remember to do that every day? All right. I'd like to have a little prayer with you guys. Would that be okay? All right. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, thank you so much for bringing all of us here together today with our church families. We're so happy to be here to praise you, Lord, and give you all the honor and the glory for all of the wonderful things you have done, and to thank you for Jesus. We welcome Jesus this week and every day. Thank you for our church family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming to talk with me this morning. Now you can go to church school.
say thank you, choir, but aren't they amazing? <clears throat> thank you. Nice job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. We'll start this time with a reading of the word from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And it seems appropriate on this Palm Sunday that we would stand for the reading. Please stand and join me. Jesus' triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the tree and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <clears throat> In her book, Plan B, Further Thoughts on Faith, Annie L Anne Lamont writes, I don't have the right personality for Good Friday, for the crucifixion. I'd like to skip ahead to the resurrection. In fact, I'd like to skip to ahead to the resurrection vision of one of the kids in Sunday school who drew a picture of the Easter bunny outside of the tomb. Everlasting life and a basket full of chocolates. Now you're talking. Why don't we jump ahead to Easter? Why do we spend so much time at the cross? What is the purpose of all this talk, the imagery, all this Im imagery about the cross? Can't we focus on something positive, the uplifting parts of the story, the loving grace of God, the mercy and forgiveness, the acceptance and the pardon. We would like to, we try to, but as Fred Craddock wrote, sooner or later, someone's going to say to you, then what happened to Jesus? And when you tell them to the truth, that he came to the city as a 33-year-old young idealist and stirred up the city and the city turned on him and just like that, put him on trial, and executed him. Well, some people are going to back away. Can't we leave that part out and just focus on the positive? People aren't interested in a man who dies like that. People aren't, it, it's, a, it's a terrible growth strategy for the church. All that morbid suffering and bleeding and dying. But yet, we live in a world where suffering and bleeding and dying are part of our daily life. Think of tornadoes, illnesses, unemployment, accidents. <clears throat> Think of the loved ones you know <clears throat> and the impossible struggles in which some of them are caught. How do we square all this suffering with the God who loves us and cares for us? We've faced these kinds of questions every single day. So why, on this week, do we not follow the Jesus who came to live among us to share our lives, not in some shallow way, but totally 
painfully, fully, lovingly meet our most important need? Today is Palm Sunday, <clears throat> and still we remember the day in which a whole city threw a parade for Jesus. As Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem, people threw palm branches, palm branches and their cloaks on the road to celebrate his arrival. The Prince of Peace was arriving this first Palm Sunday in Jerusalem a week before the resurrection. But Palm Sunday is bittersweet for us, even as we read of the celebration. <clears throat> we know that Friday and the cross is coming. We know that many in this same crowd will change their words of praise to words of death. <clears throat> Today, they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna. Later, they will be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. No greater person ever lived than Jesus. He was the very word of God come down from the Father. He is life and light, the truth and the way. And yet, no one ever emptied himself more completely of human pride than did Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Consider the donkey on which he rode into, into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday. No stallion that could be an image of strength, pride, and superiority. Most certainly, <clears throat> the humble beast of burden was not a symbol of prestige, but of service and peace. <clears throat> Jesus' entrance into the holy city <clears throat> sorry, was consistent with everything he lived and taught. Remember how offended Simon Peter was when Jesus stooped to wash his feet? That was a job for a servant, not for a distinguished rabbi. The washing of the disciples' feet, that took place at the Last Supper. Luke tells us, <clears throat> that on the way to that holy meal, the disciples had been arguing over which of them would be greatest in the kingdom. The disciples thought of greatness in terms of worldly success. To achieve success was to have others serve you. And they were caught off guard when Jesus taught Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Mark 10, verses 44 and 45. <clears throat> that was a radical teaching for them. It's radical for us. Every Holy Week, it's staggering for us to watch the strong Son of God acknowledge his dependence on the Father during those final days and hours before the cross. In the garden, he prays, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. On the cross, at the height of his misery and anguish, he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? But there's this parade. And Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. The crowd is spreading their cloaks on the road. And others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of Jesus and those who were following, the whole entourage was shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna is like hallelujah. It's a praise word, especially on Palm Sunday. It was part of the chant 
of the shouting masses as Jesus entered Jerusalem. better. But Hosanna is actually a plea for salvation. The Hebrew root words are found in Psalm 118 verse 25, which says, save us, we pray, O Lord. Literally, Hosanna means, I beg you to save, or please save us. So a humble Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, and the crowds were perfectly right to shout Hosanna. They were acknowledging Jesus as the promised anointed Messiah. You could hear it in their chanting, Son of David. And whether they realized it or not, theirs was a cry for salvation and a recognition that Jesus is able to save them. In shouting Hosanna, the people were crying out for salvation, their greatest need. And that's exactly why Jesus had come. To seek and to save the lost. To find and restore the lost. To excessively love us. But within the week, the Savior, Jesus, would be hanging on a cross. Hosanna, please save us, son of David. We're lost. One of the harsh realities of the human life and even faith is feeling lost and abandoned by God. Sooner or later, most of us will experience vacant places of the heart when God seems far away. Sometimes people say, I come to church to celebrate the presence of God in my life. Or, I come to church to worship and praise the one who saves my soul. Or I come to church to gather with the church family and to grow my faith. But if we listen carefully, we can hear others say, I come to church to try to find what's missing in my life. I come hoping that someone will shed some light on my darkness. I come so that someone will fill my emptiness. I come to church wanting someone to resolve all my doubts and questions. Have you ever experienced one of those vacant places of the heart? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever wanted to cry out, why God, why? Please save me. I feel so lost. It may be difficult for us to imagine, but Jesus, the son of the living God, experienced one of those vacant places of the heart. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, was wrapped in the garment of our humanity, and he experienced abandonment just like we all do. Do you remember the way Matthew describes the day of Jesus' crucifixion? From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And about 3 o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you see the wounds on the forehead from that crown of thorns that had been thrust down upon his head? Can you see the blood flowing down his face, the nails in his hands and feet, the wound in his side? Can you see the weak and vacant look in his eyes as he gazes into heaven and cries out, why? Yet there is something else that catches our eye on that hill outside Jerusalem, the darkness, not just the cross, Not just the crucified Christ, not the two thieves who were put to death with him, but the darkness. That's what we don't expect to see. Darkness. 
Remember, Matthew tells us that it's noon, the brightest time of the day, the time when the sun is highest in the sky. And yet, writes Matthew, from noon on, darkness came over the whole land. Can you imagine that darkness? Can you sense it? Not only the darkness that engulfed Jesus and Calvary Hill and the whole earth, but also the darkness that Jesus felt inside being abandoned by God. The darkness of the absence of God. A hopeless darkness that feels like eternal abandonment. <clears throat> Give me a second. Scott Peck, author of The Road Less Traveled, says that as children, one of our first and greatest fears is the fear of being abandoned. We feel it when we're six months old, and it scares us as much as does the fear of death. No matter how often our parents try to reassure us, no matter how often they say, don't worry, mommy and daddy are here, don't worry, mommy and daddy won't leave you, we continue to be afraid. If we are afraid of being abandoned by our earthly parents, how much more are we afraid of being abandoned by God the Father, our heavenly parent? No wonder Jesus cried out from the darkness of his cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Many of us have experienced that darkness, a dark night of the soul, a sensation of a dark absence from God, feeling abandoned by God. The young child who watches her parents divorce and then late at night cries in the darkness of her bedroom, oh God, why? The inner city family whose 11-year-old boy is caught in gang crossfire while sitting in his living room playing a video game. The family who cries, why, God, why? Because of the loss of their loved one. The worker who has poured his or her whole life into their work, a loyal employee for years, only to be let go in the twilight of their career. Hosanna, please save us, son of David. We are lost. And so we cry out, even as Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thoughtful people of faith have tried to make sense of this question for as long as there have been people of faith. But the answers never seem to be enough. They never quite fill the vacant heart cry, vacant heart's cry of why. C.S. Lewis was a popular Christian author, and early in his career, Lewis thought he had it all figured out. He went around explaining pain and suffering as if they were nothing more complicated than 2 plus 2 equals 4. Suffering is God's megaphone, he said, God's way of rousing a deaf world. It's God's way of driving us out of the nursery and helping us to grow up. But then Lewis met a woman and fell in love. And later, when she was diagnosed with a terminal illness, for the first time in his life, Lewis himself came face to face with the issue of pain. If you love someone, he said, you don't want her to suffer. You can't bear it. You want to take that suffering onto yourself. If I feel like that, then why doesn't God? Before, Lewis had handed out pious answers like he knew what he was talking about. But now he grew sick of people with phony, pat answers to complex questions, and he hated himself for having been one of them. In the end, he concluded there were no answers, at least no slick and simple ones, just painful and profound questions. This earthly life of ours, he said, is but a pale precursor of the blessed life to come, a shadow land, 
is what he came to call it. Hanging on that cross, Jesus experienced a shadow land of his own and cried out for an answer to the unanswerable question, why? But in addition to asking why, he may have been doing something else as well. He quotes from Psalm 22. Even though it's an ancient hymn that begins in anguish, it ends in affirmation. Even though it begins with a puzzling why, Psalm 22 ends in praise, singing that dominion belongs to the Lord. Dominion, authority, sovereignty, power, supremacy. Don't you wish God's dominion was as obvious as what the psalmist sings? I love to tell you that it is, but it's not. God's dominion is not a matter of objective empirical proof. Rather, God's dominion is a matter of faith and trust. Peter Marshall was a minister of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., at the same time, he served as the chaplain to the Senate. Tragically, he died of a heart attack in his early 40s. About a week before his death, Peter and his wife, Catherine, were visiting with friends. They spent the night in the guest room where there were twin beds. Late that evening, after they had gone to bed and turned out the lights long after the house was quiet, Catherine stretched out a hand toward Peter's bed and felt Peter's hand reaching out in the darkness toward hers. How did you know my hand was there, he whispered. She replied, I don't know. I just knew. God's dominion is something similar, a little mysterious, you could say. We can't prove it, we just know. It's a matter of faith and trust. A seminary professor once put it like this. When you're driving your car at night, you can't see any farther than the headlights. But you can make the whole trip that way if you just trust that the road continues. At the end of World War II, some American soldiers found some words scrawled on the basement wall of a Jewish home in Germany. I can imagine that Jewish family huddled in the basement in fear, wondering how God could allow the Nazis to commit their horrors against them and their people. Can't you imagine them cowering in fear and crying out in anguish, my God, my God, why? Yet on the basement wall, they had etched a star of David. And next to the star, one of them had written these amazing words. I believe in the sun, even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I do not feel it. I believe in God even when God is silent. That's belief in God's dominion in the midst of feeling abandoned. This is why we so often speak of faith as a journey because it implies, it implies movement from anguish to affirmation from a puzzling why to a song of praise that is one of the greatest journeys we will ever make. We've been on a Lenten journey, <clears throat> a journey from ashes to affirmation, and today there is a great celebration as Jesus, the Prince of Peace, rides into the holy city. But soon, today's Palm Sunday hosannas, change to violent charges, the celebration becomes a trial and a conviction, and the palm branches become a cross. But then on the cross, but then the cross becomes a symbol of Hosanna that God sent his only son to save us. Then our cries of crucify him will change to he is risen. Amen.
And now I need my glasses, because I didn't enlarge the bulletin. <laughs> Would you stand and sing with us the hymn of dedication uh, in the Methodist hymnal number 451, Be Thou My Vision. We do not know what the future will hold for us, but we are assured that whatever happens, God is with us. Follow Jesus boldly to the cross and beyond, for God's promises are good and true. You are beloved. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.